Okay, let's go on. Huh? We are in. Uh, we are in uh, network addressing, right? The other day we look, take a look at different types of network addresses. Class A, class B, class C, right? Different types, and how we define them, and also how to distribute the addresses. Right? So class A has the most number of addresses. Class B is somewhere in the middle, and class C is the least number of addresses per block. Right? And the thing is that if you have more addresses, then you can distribute it among your organization by subnetting. Right? So we can divide. Uh, if you get a block of addresses, you can further divide the local sub, uh, LAN addresses by subnetting to different organizations, uh, different, uh, different offices or different blocks or different buildings. Right? So it's within our control. And uh, the other thing is that the, the network address consists of two parts we saw earlier. It's always the the network prefix and uh, the other is the host ID. Right? So when we get a block of address, the network prefix we don't touch. Right? So the beginning of the IP address we don't touch, network prefix. It's only the remaining host ID is the one which we can manipulate. Right? From, so we divide our further divide, we sub, further subnet our, net, our addresses from the host ID portion. Net, network ID we don't touch, right? And we have seen examples, right? How we do that. So as a summary, we say that when we when we divide, when we subnet a block, we can get we calculate the first address and the last address, and the first address is the one which is reserved as a network address or subnetwork address, which we cannot assign to any host or any machine, right? and also the last address which we don't assign. Last address is reserved as a broadcast address for that particular subnetwork. Right? So in, in, in between is the one which you assign the, to the machines, to the hosts. So if you look at this, the first, first host is 25, last host is 30, 30 and the uh, host address, uh, network address is 24, and the broadcast is 31. So, starting, so this block is from 24 to 31. Right? 2431 is basically how many? Eight addresses. Eight IP addresses. The first is used, first is reserved, second, last is reserved. So we only have remaining of six usable IP addresses which we can assign to the hosts. So eight addresses, two be wasted. Uh, two, two cannot be used. Right? If you have 16 addresses, two cannot be used. Only the remaining 14 can be assigned to individual machines. Right? So this to, it has to be very clear. All right, so subnetting, we have seen so far, we have done at one level, right? For example, like this case, right, we have done at one level. Earlier, our, our organization is slash 26, so we have 26, uh, 26 bits for the network prefix, and the remaining is the, the remaining is for the host ID, 20, the remaining six bits. So subnet means we use some bits from the host ID to further divide into subnetwork, right? So in this case, we divide one bit or we use two bits. And the remaining five bits or remaining four bits can be assigned to individual machines on the individual subnets. Right? So this is one level of subnetting. Original is like this, you give it like this, you have, you do one level of subnetting. The thing is that this is not fixed meaning you, you can do more than one level of subnetting. Right? Just like you say, if, if you are a computer science student, right? so all of you has, if you're a computer science student, then you belong to this school. That is one level of subnetting. Or first of all, you're a USM student, okay. That's a global, right? So you're a USM student. First level of subnetting is that you depend which school you belong to. So maybe you have a school ID attached to your number. Come to the school, you can divide further to your first year or second year or, or depend on your specialization. Right? So second level sub subnetting is the specialization. And you can have third level again. 
With this specialization, you say which course do you take, right? Or which which uh, group you belong to, and so on. So this level of subnetting can actually go multiple levels. So we call this a multiple multi-level hierarchy for subnetting. You can go many levels as long as you have enough bits to manipulate. And the, the bits will depend on how many you have in your host ID. Right? So if you, depending on how many, how many bits you have in your, the, the network ID you cannot touch. As we said earlier, only the host ID is the one you can further divide to either subnetwork and also the individual machine. So no restriction number of levels. So this is normally done by large organizations. And just like say, USM has got a class B address, slash 16, meaning that the first 16 bits, IP number is belong to USM. You cannot touch that. The remaining 16 bits is further divided. We can divide so many levels. So come to USM level, uh, PPKT, all right, the, the USM admin system admins, okay, we'll, we'll server, sub, sub, subnet. Subnet to depend on schools. Right, so each school will get a, a set of addresses given to each school. That's the first level of subnetting. Come to the school, we, we, the block of addresses we get from PPKT, we just further divide some more between our, our, our levels, say uh, research labs, student IDs, uh, student labs, uh, staff uh, IP addresses, and so on. Right? So we're going on further dividing. As long as there's enough bits in the host ID. So 16 is more than enough. USM can take a few, UCS, uh, uh, computer science can take a few bits, so the remaining bits are still plenty, All right? So same thing is done normally by large organizations. Right? So IP addresses blocks are given to, to, to say, uh, to regional ISP, say ASEAN region or Asian region. So they're given one block of say one class A address, slash 24. Right, so that means there is a very large block given. They're not going to use all. So they can further divide it to so local ISP. So MIMOS, uh, TMNET, Jaring, or DG, each one given, subnetted from the original block. Right? And the local ISP, so when, when organizations ask for I, uh, IP addresses from the ISP, the ISP will further divide their allocation of the addresses to sub-blocks, to subnets, and then give to each organization the required number of IP addresses requests. You request 10, I give you 16. Right? You request 8, I give you 8, and so on. Right? And the organizations themselves will server, further subdivide into the departments, and departments can go into groups. So there are many levels of doing it. Right? So there, there's no limit, as long as there's enough bits to Manipulate. Right, so this is one example. So one ISP has a class B address, slash 16. Right? So class 16 means it has 65,000, 2 to the power of 16 IP addresses, usable IP, IP addresses. Right? So now, in, so now customers come to this ISP and say, I want a certain number of IP addresses. Right, so this ISP will, will, sub, will further subdivide the block of IP, the block of IP addresses you have, divided according to the, to the needs or the requests of each organization. Right, so let's say we have, there's one group, right? The first group, 64 customers, all of them requires 256 addresses each. Right, so then we have a second group, Require, uh, of 128 customers, all of them require 128 addresses. Another group of 28, 28, address, 28 customers requiring 64 addresses each. All right, so, so let's see how we're going to divide this. So it's very simple. The first 16 bits we don't touch. So 190.100 is the first 16 bits. So that address will remain for all these customers because that address belongs to the ISP. Right? It's only from the this two, the, the next two bytes, which we where we can further subdivide. Right? So let's say how many so how many bits do you allocate for the subnet, how many bits do you allocate for the host ID, you, all based on this. Right? So group one, the customers requires 256 addresses per user, per customer, right? So 
256 addresses means how many bits are required? So 2 to the power how many equals to 256? Right, so in this case, it's 2 to the power 8. So that means that 8 right, right bits, right most bits will be used for host ID. Right? So the prefix or the network ID will become now 32 minus 8, so 24. So it will be slash 24, slash 24, slash 24. Right? So from slash 16 for the ISP, so the first group of customers will get slash 24, right? So it has to be a bigger number than that. That's subnetting. So the first customer will get how many? First customer requires 256 addresses, right? And 64 customers. So the first customer requires 256 address. So it's from first address 190.100. The first address is this, 00. So 00, 00 until 0 0.255. That's 256 addresses. Slash 24, right? Second customer from could it finish now? So 190.100.1.024 and until 255 and for 64 customers. Right? So each one you give them. So each, each customer will be given this block. Right? So how many addresses we have used up? Simple. Uh, we have how many? We have 64 customers. Each one requires 256 address, so 64 times 256, we get 16,000. Right? Second group requires 128 addresses now. Right? So it requires 128 addresses, so in this case, we only need 7 bits for the host ID. Right? 2 to the power 7 equals to 128. Right? So then our prefix length, our network mask is slash 25 now. 32 minus 7 is 25. Right? So remember, this is it's different from the earlier one. Earlier one was 24, right? giving you the remaining 8 bits for the host. Here, the first 25 bits is the network prefix. And then the remaining 7 bits is for the host ID. Right? So again, first customer. First customer, well, we continue. The last address here was... 63.255, the next one will be 64.0. So the first address is 64.0. How many do we give? 128. So from 64.0 to 64.127. The next customer will be 64.128 until 255. All right, so give them sequentially in blocks and so on, right, until 128 customers. So how many, how, many do, how many total addresses you use? Again, 1 to 8 customers. Each one requires 1 to 8 addresses. So we have 16,000. The third group requires 64 addresses. So 64 addresses, you only require 6 bits. Therefore, we use slash 26 now. Right? So the first 26 bit it becomes a network ID. So again, we continue giving the addresses. 1 to 8, 1 to 8, the previous one, continue from here, 1 to 7, 2, 5, 5. Next one is 1280. How many addresses we give? 64, so 60, 0 to 63, 64 to 127, 128 to so on. Right? Until the last customer. Right? So how many addresses have we used? Distributed to the user customers. So you plus them up, the first three, 16,000, 16,000 plus 8,000, we get around 40, 40,000. Right? So the remaining addresses available for in the, or the ISP, that means ISP still has balance of about 24,000 plus addresses, right, which, you can, which they can actually allocate for new customers coming later. Right? So the thing is to, 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 to understand here is how do you allocate a block? Right? How do you subnet? So this is basically subnetting. Subnetting is only two things. One thing is decide how many, how many bits for the host, how many bits for the Prefix, that's all. How many bits for the host depend on how many hosts do you want, how many, how many addresses you require, right? And the prefix is just the remaining. That's all. And that becomes your network mask, slash 26, slash 26, that's all. And then you start allocating the addresses, first address until the number of addresses is given out to each customer. Right? So make sure you understand this and practice how to allocate the, the examples in your book, right, exercises, 
in your tutorial also there will be exercises. I think in your CCNA also there is, there is exercises on this. Similar things. Right? So it's very, under, it's very important that you understand how to subdivide or subnetwork the block of IP addresses given to you. So you can be given a, given a situation, say this is the block, block IP address given to a particular organization and the organization now it has so many departments, each department has a certain number of hosts. Now prepare a plan how to distribute the IP addresses to each department within the organization. Right? Right, so this is how it, it distributes again. So the same thing shows you in a graphical form how the how the address are allocated. Each customers, right? Group one customers and the IP numbers given to plus the network mask. All right. Now, these IP addresses, there are some IP addresses which are called so-called special ones, meaning that they cannot be allocated to any any machines host. We have seen two so far, right? We have seen two so far. The first address in the block, last address in the block are, cannot be allocated to any host machine. So that means these are basically special addresses, first and the last, right? But there, there are other types. So if our IP address is all zeros, 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0 what it means is that that particular, uh, that particular machine has not been assigned any IP address yet. So if your machine has not been assigned any IP address, you do not manu ma did not configure your internet on your network card, and you try to access internet, right? Your, your network card will send a packet with a source IP address of the machine will be 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0, .0 right? because if there's no IP has been assigned yet. Right? So this is a special one. So you call, we call it this host address. Right? So it's used when, so it is used when the uh, when the machine has has not been any, has not been allocated any IP address yet. We will see that later. The IP address can be either configured manually, given by the user, or it can be obtained from a server. Right? So if you obtain from a server, when you want to request an IP address from the server. You send a packet and say, my IP address is currently 0.0.0.0. .0 so the server will know, OK, someone is requesting for an IP address. Now I will give it to him. Right? So we will, take a, we will see how it's done this later on. So the thing is that all zeros is special address. And the other one is, second one is 127.0.0.0, right? Slash 8. So what does slash 8 means? It means the first. First, eight bits cannot touch. Any address which is beginning with one two seven is actually fixed; is reserved. So you cannot use this to assign to any IP address. One two seven dot zero dot zero dot zero. One two seven dot zero dot zero dot one. One two seven dot one dot five dot three cannot. Anything starting with one two seven cannot be used. That's why the slash eight means right. So slash eight means the first eight bits are cannot be changed. So we use this as a loopback address, right? That means no matter what your IP address is, the, the packet will be read, sent back to the same machine. Right? It's just like a mirror. Loop back, re reflect back. So when we use this, it's normally we use it for testing client. Right? Testing client server programs on the same machine. You, create, you have prepared your uh, client uh, application and your server application running on the same machine. So when you say your, your client wants to call the server, you can use this particular address as the, as the destination. Just like, just, just like web browser. Right? Web browser, you can put IP address of your server, right? where the web page is. So you can put HTTP colon slash slash 127.0.0.1. Where it will go? It will go back to the same machine. If there is a web server running on your same machine, it will show that particular web page. Right? That's what it means. So this is another look back. Then we have a class of private addresses. Right? But there are three, three numbers of them. Fix starting with 10, slash 10 .0 slash 8. That means the first eight bits cannot be touched. Anything starting with 10. 
is fixed, right? Is reserved. The other one is 127.16.0.0 slash 12. First 12 bits is reserved. Or 192.168 and then first two bytes, right? And also the other one. So these are three different ranges of IP address. So these addresses are so-called private addresses, meaning that they are not global IP addresses. Right? That means this particular address can only be used in an internal network, which is not connected to internet. Right? For example, we want to run client server application. Okay, we want to run a web server, web browser application only in this school. We don't want to go out. Right? We want to make sure that nobody is accessing the internet. So what do we do? We will assign all the machines with this particular IP addresses. Right? That means all the traffic, all the servers and clients, all the machines are basically local. You cannot go out with that. You cannot go to the internet on it. And that's what we mean by private addresses. So not connected to the network. So if a router receives a packet of these numbers, of the range of these numbers, it will drop the packet. It will not forward it to the internet. Right? That's what we mean by private network. Right? It's like private, private conversation. Right? For example, this class, whatever we talk here remains in this class. We're not supposed to go out. That's private. Right? So this is what it means. Then we have the broadcast address. So if all the IP address belong, if all if uh, all the bits of the IP address is one, right? Again, earlier we saw if it's all zeros, it's considered the particular host has not been assigned any IP address. If it's all one, then again it's a special case. If all one means that we want to send this packet to all the machines connected to that particular network. Everyone, right? Broadcast. So we put a we prepare, prepare a packet and then our destination address is all ones. One on one. That's our destination address. So every machine which every machine will, will get that particular application and uh, that particular packet and then read it because it is meant for that. It's meant for it. But routers normally does not broadcast packets, right? The packet come, uh, uh, a packet with this broadcast address comes to the router, it will not broadcast. Because whatever local traffic normally we do not uh, broadcast to the outside. Just like I say, this class, with whatever I say, there's a doors and all that, the walls, make sure it doesn't broadcast to the outside. It otherwise means the cl classes from the next door, other lecture halls will also, we can hear, the, hear their conversation inside here. Right? And it's not related to that. Right? So this, this is a, so broadcast is limited. It's normally broad, not broadcast to the, out, to the internet. Otherwise, somebody, somebody communicating between the US and Japan and between among themselves, we also get a traffic here. Right? We don't want that. So this is a limited broadcast, right? all, all ones. The other one is the one we saw earlier, right? which is directed broadcast, means for specific network or subnetwork. This is for all the hosts on the land. It's only for specific uh, subnet only. So depending, right? So you depend on the network address or network address or the broadcast address. So these are the one we saw earlier. So there are different types of IP address. So I mean, these IP addresses, this one, network address, broadcast address, all ones, all zeros, one to sevens, and that all and all these private addresses normally we do not assign to the machines if you want to connect to internet. Right? That's the idea. Okay. All right, so let's take a quick look at what the DHCP works. Right? We saw the DHCP here. Yeah, right. So, the, so when we have, so when an uh, when, uh, organization is given a, a block of IP addresses like this, or has been assigned IP addresses like this, say first customer has been given these IP addresses. Okay, fine. Let's say you have 40 machines, right, in your lab. You have been given 48, uh, 64 addresses. Okay, fine. Right? Now, we need to assign the IP addresses to the, each machine. 
How do you do it? You go to each machine, open up the network uh, cards, uh, TCP IP, uh, what you call it, the, the, the network configuration, and then manually assign the number. Right? That's one way to do it. Each machine you go, you assign directly. I say this machine number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. And I have to make sure I keep track. So make sure I don't duplicate the addresses and keep keep track which user is using which IP address. So next time new, new IP address, new user comes in, I know which which address is not being used, so I, I can go and manually configure that. That's one way. The problem is that if a user changes or user goes away, a new machine comes or network card has to be replaced, then we need to assign again the IP address. Second thing is that somebody can steal your IP address. Let's say another person comes in, right? It's not authorized, he wants to use the internet, cannot be, not give an IP address, okay, fine. I, I look at my, my neighbor's one, what IP address, and I use it. When the person is not using, I use it. If both are used at the same time, then problem. Right? So there's no control. So a better way is that IP addresses are not assigned manually by users. It is automatically assigned by a server, which is the, the DHCP server. All right? So what DHCP server is, has is that it has a block of IP addresses. A range of IP addresses is already been, has been kept in the server. So when a user starts with this machine, let's say this machine wants, wants to assign IP address, when it starts, you on the machine, when you switch on the machine, it has no IP address yet. So you switch on, it will send a packet out with, with, with 000 IP address, send out. And then the DHCP, will, 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 will DHCP server will actually respond, say, okay, I get a request from a user who wants an IP address. So now I look at my list, I have I have 64 addresses in my block. Okay, I give one to this particular user. So now that machine will get a, will capture this IP address and then use it for some time. Another use, another machine switches on, it will also get another address. So the, the server will keep track which IP number has been assigned to which user. Right, so in this case, there's no, no duplicates. Right, so this is what we will so share. So we basically share, share a set of IP addresses among users. So what you can do is that normally is that the the DHC server might have number of IP addresses, but the users might be more than that. Right. So if the if the if you have uh, say sixty four addresses, you have eighty machines. Right, meaning that. The first 64, not everybody will start using at the same time. That, that, that's the assumption. Right? So at any time, 64 users can be connected to the internet. So one user, so they give IP address, so the server will give IP address for the user for only a short period of time, a few hours. After that, if the, after a few hours, that particular IP address will expire. And it has to be re renewed. If the user is still connected. If they switch off, fine. The IP number is released and can be assigned to someone else. Right, so that's the idea. So we can have more users than IP addresses. If you use the manual configuration, it's now individual, the system admin or the user go and one by one key in the IP address, then if you have 80 machines, you require 80 addresses. Right? So IP address is assigned temporarily to the user when requested. So the server has a block of IP addresses. So the server will send information to the client, which includes the, the assigned IP address, the mask, what is the default router address, and also the, the DNS server address right, for, the, for the domain service. All right, so, so in this case, is that normally, uh, so this, this server normally will, will assign uh, IP addresses in that way. A block of IP addresses he has, so what you will assign one by one, uh, as and when needed, and to the user requests. So here we assume that that the that the organization has a, has a has a number of IP addresses given. So maybe a block, 
60 addresses, 64 addresses, 32 addresses, and so on. Right? But what happens is that if you only have one IP address given to you, right, there's a, there is a way which we, we can use one global IP address for the whole organization. Right? So this is where the NAT, the network address translation, comes in. And let's say you, you, you request IP address from, say, uh, Mimos. Right? You buy one IP address. OK, fine. Now you set up your own, own, own home organization. You set up your own land at home, your own business, with about 20, 30 machines, all connected to land. And you want to connect all of them to internet. How do you want to do that? One way is to, because you require internet means you require IP address. So either you, you request MIMOS to say, give me, please give me 10 or 20 more IP address. I, and you have to buy for it. You have to buy it. If they have remaining left. If they don't have, the other way is to use NAT. That means you share one IP address with your whole organization, with the, whatever number of machines. Right? So how we do that is that one global IP address will, will be used for external use. And we use the private IP addresses for internal use. The private address is the one dot, 10 dot something. Right? So that's why we use this now. Example, in our machine also, internally to our school, we use all 10 dot something. Because the IP addresses given by PPKT to us are not enough. Right? We have about thousands of machines. They only give us a few hundred IP addresses. Right? Because it's not enough. So we have to find another way. Right? So that's how it works. Right? So, so internally, so this is the router. So the router will have one valid IP address, or the global IP address, which is given to you by, right? And the router connects your local LAN. And all the machines in the LAN, in your local LAN, local area network, will have a private IP address, starting with 10.0, or starting with 172, or starting with 169, whichever it is, right? The, the range is now, 172 or 192, right? So the example is given for 172. So all these are private addresses. So what it means is that now, since this is a private address, the, the, once the packet of this machine wants to go to the internet, it goes to the router. Since this is a private private address, it will it will drop the it will drop the packet, because private net addresses are not allowed to go internet. But with this NAT service, it will convert the private address to the global. IP address, and then it will pass the packet to the outside. Because the outside world, internet will not recognize your local IP, uh, your, your private IP addresses. Right? So private IP addresses must be substituted with a valid IP address. And we only have one valid, we only have one valid address, right? which is this one. So, so the router must be running this service, NAT service. Right? right, so the internet will only see this global IP address. You cannot see this one because these are, pub are private numbers. They're not, not visible. So, so the router now has to do extra duty. It has to convert the private numbers into a global number for outgoing traffic and for incoming traffic the global number, IP number, has to be converted back to the local IP number. Right? And just as like you say, if you want to, if you, all of you, consider in this class, in this room, has local IP numbers. Right? But you want to connect outside, you cannot. You have to use somebody, maybe you have to use me. Right? You have a message to send someone, you send through me. I'm the one which, which is seen to the outside, they do not know you. Right? So you give me, I will, you give me a letter, say your name, I will substitute your name with my name and then send it out. Right? And outside world recognizes me, and then when they reply back to me, I look at the message, I say, okay, this is the person who actually requested it, I substitute my name and then with your name and then give back to you again. Right? So that's how it works. So outgoing traffic, so source, that's, the packet will contain source address and destination address. Destination address is the, is the, is the server address which you want to get. For the web, the web server address you want to go to, right? 
And then source is your machine number, which is a private number. So once it comes to the router, the entity router will substitute your, your private number into the global IP address and then sends it out. Now this packet becomes valid packet. All right. So when, the, when, the, when the, the server replies to your request, to this particular traffic, you will reply to who? You will reply to this source. Right? So now, destination is this. The router looks at it, hey, this is to me. But it knows that the, 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 the traffic does not belong to it because it belongs to someone inside the local network. So you will substitute the destination to the original sender's local IP address, private IP address. Then you will pass on to the, to the, to the network, and then you will reach the machine. Right? So there's a substitution or replacement of IP address from private to global and global to private as the traffic is moving inward or outward from the, from the network, the local network to the uh, internet by the router. Right? So the NAT requires address translation. So in order to do that, the router must keep a table. Right? It must know who is sending. So as the packet comes in, right? Packet comes in, what it do? It will take, okay, this this user is, is sending this user is sending data to this particular internet IP address. So you will say, okay, source is this one, destination is this one. Keep it here. Keep it in the table. Now, after that, you will translate, do the translation. And then the source address will be substituted with the, with the, with the router's global IP address. Change this to global IP and then send it out. Right? Now the packet comes back. Now the reply comes back. Reply comes back like this. The router will check, right? Because the, the destination means it is actually received by the router. Router has to check this, particular, this packet, who actually sent it. How does he know? Look at the table, right? So he says, okay, uh, the source is this, that's an, so you say, the source is this one, coming from this particular machine. Who actually sent this particular, who, who, which packet sent this data earlier to this source? So look through here, it's actually this one. So since this machine sent the data to there, it, it must be expecting a reply, right? So now you substitute the source address with the, this private address. Substitute that and then send the packet back to the local library. Right? Right? So he does that. The problem is that what, what we are keeping now, we are keeping a pair of private IP address and the address, the destination address. Right? So if another user, another user accesses another, another Web server, it's okay. Different local, different private IP address, different external IP address, it's fine, right? But if the same, or rather, if, if, if a different local user want to go reach the same destination, then we have a problem. So our lo we have keep two addresses, the local, this one, 3.1, going to this machine, 3.2 also going to the same machine. Okay, fine, keep it here. But when the reply comes, the router cannot decide who was the original sender because now you have two entries. Right? So this is a problem. So it will be a problem that if two, machine, two local machines in the private network, two or more local machines in the private network are connecting to internet to the same host, that will be a problem. Because when the reply comes, the router will not be able to figure out this traffic belongs to who now. Right? It must be a one-to-one -one mapping. Right? Because we only have, why? Because we only have one, we only have one global IP address to usable. Right? So it's only one, if one IP address, we only can do one internal host to one external host mapping. All right. So the other, another way is that instead of only have one, one valid IP, we can have 
a few valid IP. Right? So instead of only having one uh, global IP address, we have, say, three or four, for example. So now three or four can be used for different users. Right? So if, an, if a router has a multiple global addresses, then many internal hosts can connect to one or many external hosts, as long as not the same one. Right? So in this case, again, if a different user 3.2 comes in and wants to send data to, to, uh, to the same machine, the same machine, then it will, it will substitute uh, a different address. And instead of 5.8, it will give 5.9, for example, if you have a few global IP addresses. Right? So depending on how many global IP addresses the, the, the router has. The, but there must be a, a pair of a unique pair of internal external hosts. Right? That's the requirement. And said earlier, if one internal host wants to connect to many multi external hosts, again cannot, because the mapping will be now you do not know which one it belongs to. Right. So the solution to this is that earlier we only keep a mapping of internal address, private address, and external address. So if you expand that, if you modify that, we also include the port address and the port, internal port and external port. So we're coming, say, from this machine, internal machine, with this port number, sending to this external address with this port number. Now it'll be clearer, right? So if a different user comes in, if a different, it will be different IP address. If the same user send again, so same, same user, connects to two different machines, two different hosts, then it will have same, same IP address, but the port will be different now, right? Because it's a different host, different process running. So you have two, three process running on the same machine, same IP address, but the port number will be different then, right? So we can distinguish that by the mapping of private address and port address, right? So this one can be able to solve that. Right? So in this case, Multiple internal hosts can connect to multiple external hosts, right? Even though using one IP address, provided that we keep the port address, port numbers, internal as well as external port numbers together with their IP addresses. Right? So now our table becomes slightly more complex. Right? So NAT also is used to. Uh, as one way to, to make use when you do not have enough IP addresses for your organization, you have more machines than your IP addresses, then this is one strategy to use. Right? We can use either DHCP server or use NAT. Right? So for example, even ISPs for example, right? For example, like, like uh, MIMOS, right? Or DG or TMNet for example. Now, how many customers does TMNet has? A millions? Okay, maybe let's say, let's say one million, right? TMNet, so ISP has one million customers, active customers. Do you think they have one million IP addresses for you? No. Impossible. Right? There's not enough IP addresses. So what they do? They use this kind of thing, NAT. Right? They probably have a list of, say, 1,000 IP addresses, maybe. Or maybe 10,000 or whatever it is. Right? So meaning that, at any time, they know that by, by studying the traffic patterns, at any one time, not more than 1,000 or 10,000 users will be currently using connected to the internet out of these 1 million customers. Right? If, that's why sometimes, right, just, like your DG, uh, just like your phone line and all that, sometimes you, you, have, the, you have the signal but you try to call someone or you try to send a message, cannot de message don't, not delivered or cannot be called. But the signal is there. So what's happening? It's just too many people are connecting. Right? Just like you say, if you go to a big, big uh, especially, especially if, if it's a big uh, event, right? I don't know uh, where, for example, like, like, the, like the Penang Bridge run, right? Everybody's running at the same time, capturing pictures, updating the, their pictures on the Facebook while running. All right? So there are about 100,000 people running. 
at the same, same area together. And all of them will be connecting to the same AP, the, the same uh, tower, for example. So the tower probably has a limit, only 1,000 simultaneous connections. Right? So that's what happens. The same thing for energy. Right? So the ISP will have about a list of a, a certain set of, a set of valid IP addresses. And then the customers, as they come in, each one will be, used, will be assigned a private address. Right? And then there will be a translation working there. Right? So each one will give a private address. And the ISP side will do the entity translation for their to convert your private IP address into a valid IP address. Right? So this way, we do not have to use a huge, huge number of IP addresses. OK? Yeah. All right, then that's it. OK, uh, one announcement before you go. Uh, Friday, there's no class. Right, so Friday class canceled. We'll see you next week.